meeting, not a webinar. So um, we can see you all. And we are going to record this meeting because a few people have signed up but are unable to join live. So they'd like to see the recording. Um, so we'll send those participants the recording um, and we'll then edit the video to upload it to YouTube so that um, other people can listen back to the presentations. But we'll, we'll keep the, the chit chat separate from that. Um, and if you'd particularly like to ask something and you want to make it clear that you'd like it not to be recorded, that's fine too. Um, please say that and, and we can make sure that you're edited out. Um, so as I said, it's a meeting. So you're all here visible. Um, we're going to keep everybody on mute and just unmute the, the people who are presenting. Um, and then at the end, we should have loads of time for questions and answers, and we'd love you to ask them. You can raise your hand, um, which is, um, and then we'll ask you to say your question. You can unmute yourself and speak, um, or you can type a message into the chat, whichever you prefer. Um, just all the usual caveats of, you know, please let other people finish their questions before jumping in. Um, and you know, general manners, which I'm sure you all have. Um, so today we are going to have two presentations. The first one is going to be from Arwell Jones, who's my colleague in Wales, um, and he manages the, the operations over on the Clean Peninsula and has been involved uh, from the beginning of the Econ Gwedba and before that from the Clean Landscape Partnership, which is, what, which is what he is going to talk about today. And he'll be followed by a presentation from Gwenan Griffith, who is our digital community officer within LIVE. Um, and she's going to talk to you about the Econ Gwedfa initiative, which is Wales' first eco-museum. I hope I'm not spoiling it by saying more. And then we also have present um, Robert Parkinson and Laura Hughes from the National Trust. And two of the seven Econ Gwedfa sites in Wales are National Trust sites, so it's great to have them here. Um, Laura is the Visitor Experience Officer for the area in Wales, and Rob is the Engagement Officer. So they've really relevant roles, and I think will be really interesting for some of the people in Ireland to hear what they have to say as well. So if you have any questions for them at the end, um, feel free to direct them that way. Um, so Arwell, you might like to kick off. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for the introduction. I'm uh... I'm not going to disappoint you all by uh, by presenting. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a quick verbal uh, introduction to to the partnership and how the Eco Museum project has come about in Anderson Peninsula. Um, just to give you a bit of background information, uh, I, I I live and work on the Slim Peninsula. Um, I've been managing landscape scale projects for nearly 18 years now on and off, mainly environmental work, but also uh, I've done a lot of community development work before that. So um, going back to 2004, uh, we were managing uh, coastal management work around the Slim Peninsula, uh, half a million pound project that led into the development of the Clean Landscape Partnership, which then pulled in the community side of things and the voluntary sector as well. So over time, we've expanded what we were doing, um, carrying on with the environmental work, but also looking at new opportunities as to how tourism, uh, heritage, and the people on the peninsula can benefit um, economically, but also uh, have a better quality of life through tourism. So I was uh, lucky enough to go up uh, with a few colleagues up to Sky uh, in Scotland. And we have Angus Murray uh, on the call as well from the Sky Eco Museum. And uh, we were introduced to the Eco Museum concept up there. And it was very clear to me that what they were, they'd started up in staffing would fit in very nicely with the work that we were doing down on the Slim Peninsula, the, the collaboration 
uh, the working between sites and so on. And we we picked up on everything that was good on the Sky uh, model and brought it back to, to Wales. And over the last five or six years, we've developed that model. Um, and then our involvement with Cork uh, University has led to this project. Uh, we were obviously looking forward to our learning visits over to Ivra and sharing all the, the good practice that we've developed with the community over there, the, the businesses and everybody else that's that's in, interested in, in, in the model. Hopefully that can happen in the near future. Um, we're hoping to all be vaccinated in Wales by the end of July, so we'll be able to possibly come to you before you come to us, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it's very it's a very different way of working because everything is about collaboration, sharing best practice and moving everybody along together for the benefits of the area. And, and that sounds very simplistic, but in a nutshell, that's all it is. The, the Eco-Museum uh, model in Wales is all about digital uh, using digital technology to, to market the area effectively, improving the skills of the people that live on the peninsula to, to utilize that and make the most of it, not paying vast amounts of money for external companies and consultants to market the area on our behalf, but also to, to tell our own story and talk about culture, heritage, and how that ties in with, with the environment as well, so that you know, the, the, the language is then central to all the work that we do and we can convey those messages to people that visit the area. I know we've got, uh, we're trying to keep uh, an extended period of time at the end for questions and discussions because uh, having attended a lot of these kind of meetings recently in the last year, we, a lot of people do talk for a long time and then the, the questions tend to be squeezed in at the end. So I'm, I'm going to stop talking there. Um, it's, it's just a very quick introduction to the project and I will pass on to Gwen and who uh, will dazzle you with your presentation, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Arwell. I'm just going to share with you a presentation that kind of looks back at the work of the Ekam Gedva from how it started to where we are today. So I'm just going to share my screen with everybody. I'll try to. Does that work now? Can you guys see that? Yeah? Okay. I can't see you anymore, but hopefully you can see this and you can hear me properly as well. So let me just get this going. So the story so far. I'll start, start off with the simple stuff. What is the Ekam Gedeva? Well, to put it simply, it's a collaborative digital marketing campaign between seven of the main heritage sites on the Clean Peninsula. Uh, we're promoting the area's rich cultural heritage, um, as well as the natural heritage, using the Ekom Gedva hashtag and brand. And why are we doing this? What we're trying to do? Well, I'm sure it's the same in Ivra, but um, tourism here is very seasonal. So from well, from April up to the end of September, it's really, really busy here. We're almost at full capacity. But then we have the total opposite of that during the winter period. So what we're trying to do is extend the whole day period and attract people to the area during the quiet times of the year and using the natural and cultural assets in order to draw people here to visit during those times. So this will lead to Sorry, there might be a bit of a lag between the, the presentation and, and what I'm saying. But um, so this will lead to a, an increase in cultural and natural tourism in the area, a year round sustainable tourist industry that bring economic, environmental, and social benefits to the area as well. We are specifically targeting people that have retired 
couples and young family that have an interest in the cultural, linguistic, environmental um, heritage. So what we're trying to do, we're not trying to kind of get more people to come to the area throughout the year. What we're simply trying to do is spread that crowd out throughout the year and fill up those empty beds during the, the quieter times. So as I mentioned, there are seven main heritage sites um, that are part of the Econ Gedra in Pentlin. And here they all are. So we're starting off with Nanskur Fair, which is the National Language Centre based on the northern coast of the Italian Peninsula. This is the Llyn Maritime Museum, which is about three miles away down the road from Nanskur Fair um, and is based in Nevin. This is Canolvan Velinacha, Velinacha Centre, which is based in Rhosirwain, uh, slightly inland compared to the other sites, but is a traditional skills centre. This is Portasunt, which is managed, managed by the National Trust, and Lauren and Rob from the Trust are here with us today. Um, it's an interpre interpretation centre in Abadaron. Um, when you visit the, the centre, you've got little snippets about the area. And then the whole purpose of it is to kind of draw you out to the landscape to, to um, enjoy the landscape for yourself using what you've learned in that centre. Um, and then we have another National Trust property, which is Pleasant View. It's a, and correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, I think it's a 17th century manor house. It's not 16th century, I don't think. So, Yes, yeah, lovely um, manor house and with beautiful gardens and a little cafe. Um, Oriel Plas Glynweddle, which is Wales' oldest art gallery. And finally, the National Sailing Academy, uh, Plas Hilly, which is located on the south side of the peninsula um, in Pchilly. So those are the main seven heritage sites that are part of the Ekom Gedra. I'm just going to share with you a map that shows their location. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. So you've got Nanskur Thayen at the top here and then it, they're all dotted around the peninsula. Um, similar to what you guys have with the Wild Atlantic Way, we have the All Wales Coastal Path that kind of joins the dots almost so you can easily um, walk from one site to another. Um, which is a great day out for the family. Um, we also work closely with um, the Coastal Bus Service. So that runs during, well, it'll be running from Easter till the end of the summer so, as well. And that takes you from one site to another. It doesn't go on the main uh, bus route, it goes on the coastal path, um, well, coastal routes. Um, and that's a sustainable, sustainable way of traveling around the peninsula, you know, taking cars off the roads and so forth. Obviously, the bus hasn't been running over the last year due to, to COVID. So the Ecom Gather model is completely inclusive of everybody in the community. We have a bottom-up approach. So the Ecom Gather by itself and you know the website, social media accounts act as a portal to disseminate user-generated content that's kind of derived from community. So those seven core partners work really closely. They act as a community hub almost. They work closely with the local schools, the local businesses that surround each hub, the community, and we have loads of voluntary groups here as well. So it's all kind of driving content um, from the ground up but it's promoting it to a worldwide audience. I'm going to talk just very briefly, I'll scan through this um, section of our project, the background and kind of the funding that we've had over the years to enable us to kind of reach where we are today. So believe it or not, the project actually started back in 2014, um, where we received um, KTP funding, which stands for 
knowledge transfer partnership. Um, it was through Bangor University that we re received this um, funding, and Oriel Plas Glinweather, which was the art gallery, was the was the kind of commercial partner in this venture. And it was the whole purpose of this funding was to kind of trial and give it a go, you know, to establish the Eco Museum here on, on the Clean Peninsula. And we had a really, really successful first year. And I'll share some stats with you um, from the first year um, in a few minutes. And as with any kind of funding, it um, came to an end. And then the project was then transferred over to Bangor University at the Sustainability Lab. And from the following years, we've had snippets of small fun thing to keep us going, basically. Um, we can share a copy of this presentation with you all so you can see the different kind of funding sources, but I won't talk too much about those. Um, and then we're in kind of year five now, um, which was, we started with a live project. So it's an Intrec funded project. Um, UCC are the main partners, and then you've got Bangor, uh, the partners on the Welsh side. But we've, we've also um, got other partners involved, Kerry County Council, the National Trust, South Kerry Development Partnership, and Gwynedd Council. So just so you guys know these areas. So Pentlion is here, and then Ivera is here. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think Ivor is three times the size of Fentlin. Um, so much bigger area, but it's very similar um, in terms of tourism and landscape as well. Okay. So I'll talk a bit about project delivery, how we go about um, business, so to speak, uh, so to speak. So, as I mentioned, um, it is a digital marketing campaign, essentially. Uh, the type of things that we promote are, you know, videos, apps, guides, self-guided guides, and so forth to walk the coastal path and visit the sites. Um, using social media to specifically target our audience, but enabling local content to be delivered to a worldwide um, audience. Um, seven main collaborators, um, but we are constantly encouraging content to be created by people that live here. The other aspect of the project is the digital marketing training um, that was provided to the Eco Museum staff and the volunteers that work with each site. So during the first year of the KTP funding, I wrote a series of five digital marketing um, workshops that were delivered to the ECOM Gedra staff and some of their volunteers as well. Um, it, was, it was making use of kind of the free tools that are out there on, on the internet for people to, to use and to kind of utilize the digital marketing tools. It was designed as a train the trainer program because many of the sites have volunteers. So they could then easily, once they've kind of attended the training, they could easily pass on their skills. Um, and it was again, you know, it was great to boost the staff confidence with just, you know, giving them the power to be creating their own content rather than outsourcing, um, you know, their marketing work to, to other companies. So the training included um, Digital stamp, so basically googling yourself to see what's what's um, being said about you online. Uh, looking at your digital stamp and social media management, so looking at tools like Hootsuite and, and Buffer. Targeting via social media, looking at the different social media platforms and their demographics. Creating digital content. Things such as videos, um, photos, e-newsletters, all sorts. Creating blogs and websites. And finally, something that's quite relevant now, um, online events management, looking at things like events sprites and, and so forth. So it's kind of complete package that, um, yeah, just boosted the staff confidence and 
made them give a go, you know, give digital marketing a proper go. So, oh yeah, we've got some photos of uh, the guys in, in training. I, I can assure you that they look a bit bored in this first one, but they, they and hopefully they were quite entertained when they were attending the sessions. Um, we used to travel around the different sites as well, so which was quite nice because you know normally people don't get the time to be, especially if you're working in a, in one of the heritage sites, they don't normally get have the time to go and visit other ones. So it was, it was good that we were kind of traveling around each session, each site as well. Um, so the types of things that we were promoting on the social media accounts, I'm just going to go through some photos now. So just promoting, you know, the landscape, the biodiversity, the way that people live here on the same peninsula. A um, bit of local history, um, public events. This is a snapshot of one of the um, self-guided um, apps that we developed during the first year. So each of the sites have their own kind of circular walk. Um, and this app was developed to um, enable you to walk through the sites, follow a path, and then when you come to a, a waypoint, a bit of interpretation comes up on your phone then to explain a bit further about, about the site. And then we also, some of the sites is, sorry, <laughs> Laura and Ralph, he, he were in a kayak with a bunch of school kids. They offer free kayaking um, sessions in uh, Port de Sant. And we also, yeah, Another, this is another uh, event that's hosted in on the peninsula, which is the coastal sporty for 54 mile bike ride around the, the uh, peninsula. I think you've got something similar in Kerry with the Ring of Kerry cycle as well, which I think is probably about three or four times the distance as well. So that's the type of things we were promoting. Um, I'll share with you some stats from the just the first year. So up until now with the live project, we have had zero marketing budgets, which is quite strange for a digital marketing campaign. But we did did the most of things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and we used issue for our newsletters and and so far. Um, by the end of the first well, when the KTP finished, we had combined combined followers of just over 27,000, which was an increase of just over 15,000 since the project started. We would easily reach up to 150,000 people in one day on Twitter when an event was on in the peninsula. Um, and we, we have a, you know, we have a worldwide audience. We have a massive following in South America for some reason. Um, I think they're the second, our main audience is Wales and, and the UK and then it's South America, I think is due to the connection between Wales and, and Patagonia, I'm not sure. Um, but I can say hand on heart that we wouldn't have reached this amount of people without the collaboration that's happened locally on, on the chain. And it's all down to kind of sharing good practice. Uh, during the first um, phase as well, we saw a 10% increase in visitor numbers during the quiet times of the year, which contributed 2 million to the local economy. So what's next? Um, we've rebranded, but really nice uh, branding that's shared with the, the, the live um, project. And it also matches uh, live's vision and aims and, and objectives. We can't wait to be working with you all in Aydra. Um, it's, as Arvel mentioned earlier, it's a shared learning project. We're looking forward to collaborating um, sharing good practice and to learn um, from the community in Ivora to ensure a sustainable future for all, both regions. So I'm going to finish off um, with the Wales football team motto. I'm not, it's too early to mention the rugby. So the Wales football team motto is Cravach and Gilead, together stronger. I think when we work to, together as a community, we can achieve amazing things. So Give us a follow online. These are our details. And that's our work address. So thank you very much for listening. I'm gonna we're gonna finish off 
with a video and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm going to ask Orla to kindly share a video with us, with you all, um, that promotes um, Abadaron, one of the areas on the Clean Peninsula. I hope you enjoy. Can you see the screen okay? Yeah. like this before in my life I ain't seen nothing like this before in my life I ain't seen nothing like this before in my life That was the most relaxing thing. That's lovely. I remember um, I remember I came across that video when I saw the, the ad for my job and I was looking into what the project was all about and I watched it and I haven't watched it again since. So um, back then only thought COVID would be short lived and I imagined myself spinning over and walking on the Wales coastal path, but it still hasn't happened. Um, but hopefully it will still. Um, so thank you so much, the two of you, for, for speaking about the background to what you guys have done in Wales. Um, it's, it's kind of always really nice to, to reinforce um, how what you've done is so suited to the place and has had such a positive impact. Um, we already have one question in the chat box, which is from um, Lucy Hunt. And she's asking, it might be a question for you, Laura, um, about being able to offer free activities for kids and families because it's something that she'd love to do more and with schools um, and getting kids and families out in nature without them having to pay for it all the time. And maybe you talk about the work of the National Trust and how that works for you guys. Yeah, great. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, we started um offering the, the the free play opinion specifically we kind of set up um schedule of it was kind of a program of events that we delivered every summer where we were offering beach days and um various events we had one event called glass and more which was like a um an event based on the culture of the fishing port that was held and we had food tasters and demonstrations and family activities and things um when we initially started those events we kind of tried to tap into some so um for example the uh Shilin aonb sustainable development fund um we were able to tap into them as um 
to deliver those events so that enabled us to give those free experiences um but we just found over time we found that, that it was such such a valuable experience and such an invaluable kind of engagement opportunity for us as the national trust as well and um, we felt that quite often those type of events that that kayaking or paddle boarding more recently was kind of almost the hook into a new audience and into a new um kind of families or, or people that wouldn't necessarily tap into the kind of traditional national trust messaging um, so we found that that was a really good hook to kind of get people in and engaging with us as a charity. So more recently, we've actually been funding some of those activities ourselves. Um, and actually, the most recent um, season we run them, the beach fund days, we actually started to have having to charge people a really, really minimal charge of five pounds to take part in them, mainly because it was just balancing um People, people were, bit, we were starting at 11 and we could have filled the, the, the sessions all by one minute past 11, shall we say. So that kind of minimal charge was more to kind of make it fair for everyone really than trying to make it a commercial venture. But definitely kind of doing the, putting that, for us, putting that effort into those kind of engagement events has worked really well because we can have so many different conversations and kind of chats with people about the work that we do through them. It's really good. Yeah, and answered, or whether whoever's asked wants to ask thanks, some more. Thanks, Laura. No, that's great. And and I think we do quite a bit of that, but it's you know, we're always we're always looking for funding to run any of these nature connection events. And and yes, we do get the funding, but it'd be great to have a long-term program, you know, instead of us getting piecemeal funding to run our marine creature features on the blue flag beaches for free, where we engage, you know, thousands of people over time who actually then actually get into the environment and, and fall in love with it. And, you know, and it's just from these introductions like you're offering, but it's because it's free and it's kind of, they just came upon it. And, you know, I think it's really important that there's a long-term structure. So, it, uh, instead of us always trying to find bits of funding here and there you know so is that something that you have you have a long-term structure within the um, framework of your project or or are you kind of like us <laughs> looking for the funding all the time um, it, for, uh, um, similar similar to you <laughs> unfortunately I'd like to say otherwise but um, experience so far has been yeah it's been um, looking for those for those parts getting involved in initiatives like the Sealing Coastal Festival which has come with its own kind of funding source or yeah tapping into the different different funds we've been lucky in terms of our um internal resource we've had kind of engagement officers we've had a core group of staff that are kind of focused on that type of activity so like yourselves we've been able to kind of deliver these different engagement events over the years. And Robert's done a lot of work with local schools, um, especially, and kind of working on those nature connection activities with schools and, and young children on the peninsula. Um, but yeah. no, the, uh, there isn't really anything longer term financial wise. Yeah. Okay, no, thanks very much, Laura. Good to hear we're all in with the same challenges, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> But enjoying the work as well at the same time, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I just uh, put in there and just say I think one of the main things that we've seen on the peninsula since the beginning of the coastal festival and so on is that the take up of local people who kayak and surf has increased uh, substantially, and because of that, they are then happy to share information with people who are on holiday about those activities as well. So instead of it being a visitor activity, it is a activity that the local community particip participate in as well. And I think yeah. that's a major shift over a period of time where the people that live in the community work and then everybody else enjoys themselves by kayaking or surfing. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously there's a tradition of fishing in the area and so on, but there's a shift now in how people utilize the natural environment around them because they've been able to go on these taster sessions over a period of time. 
Yeah, that's very valuable. That's something we offer as well as a taster, a free taster session to staff in like hotels and restaurants um, so that they can um, also talk about it, you know, to tourists and um, to fam- to their own family. So it is really important to have those taster sessions for sure and, and to make sure that they're freely available. Yeah, but that's great to hear. Aaron. Thanks for those questions and nice answers. So if anybody else has a question, um, at the bottom of your screen is a little button that says reactions. You're free to click on that and raise your hand or put something in the chat like Lucy did. Um, I have a question for Gwenna. Um, sorry, what? Yeah. There's a, there is a question from Jean in the chat as well, Lucy, just in case you're not seeing I it. I can't see it. Someone else will have to read it. It didn't come to me. <laughs> uh, I'll read it as well. How, how did you run the five digital workshops? What what venues, what times, scale over what period and how many did you train? Um, we run them. Basically, I, I wrote the course. And my, my background is in digital inclusion. Um, so I wrote the course uh, during the first year of the project. Um, venues. So we had five um, sessions and they were held in, if I remember rightly, um, Oriol Pascal Nuevo, Mount Good Bay, and um, Pru, uh, Maritime Museum. Where else are we? <laughs> Can't remember. Yeah, there was about three places. Three, but I think two, we had to go maybe there's a central office where Arwell is based. That's um, some, one of the other sites that we used for training as well. So we were all done in the different communities within on the same peninsula. Um, time scale, they were all delivered um, during the first year of the project. Um, how many did they train? I think off the top of my head, it was, it was close to about 50 people, but that was just the Eco Museum sites and also some of the volunteers. Um, example of the volunteers were the Maritime Museum in Nevin, because only one person runs that venue, but she's heavily dependent on the volunteers that work with her. Um, and obviously she can't do everything. So we train the volunteers there to run the social media for her. Um, and they were all, I think, um, I think they were all kind of 50 plus and they were gaining so much more than just, obviously they were getting to learn how to use kind of it for, for marketing purposes, but they were getting really good skills at the same time that maybe they can use for everyday life, you know, online banking, that kind of thing, just to give that, them that confidence to um, to do things online. Um, each session was half a day long, wasn't it, I think? Um, so yeah, from nine till 12, and then we'd break after lunch. They were all free, yes. Um, we, yeah, because my background is in inclusion so you know the cost of writing them was part of part of the job really wasn't it so yeah I was going to ask you going on actually a really related thing was about how you decided on the topics or what the needs were of of people locally um I think we asked the sites initially um what they wanted help with um and then just a bit of background myself to see what what were the core things that people wanted to to learn about i think a lot of people are on social media but they they might be not kind of utilizing their time properly or not sure if they're on the right platform so like i think a lot of people got a lot out of the um targeting one because maybe one side would maybe focus just on say instagram which has a massive demographic of the younger audience and maybe their target audience was an older generation where you'd kind of move on to maybe using Twitter, you know, it was just opening up different avenues really through the different um, channels. Okay, thanks. Um, and Arwell, in your initial opening, you were saying that one of the kind of key things that you were setting out to do was to look at the ways that tourism could improve the way of life on the Clean Peninsula as well as just being a kind of a money spinner. Um, 
were there doubts about that at the beginning and did it take people a long time to to kind of come along with you or how did you find those starting phases of your the landscape partnership uh, you know we had uh, pilgrims coming to the Clean peninsula for four or five hundred years of tourism is it's not a new thing um but i think what possibly has changed is what people want out of their visits you know the the cultural side, the heritage side, you know, what makes that area different to somewhere else. Um, so I think the the technology has made the the consumer more sophisticated in what they're looking for and developing that offer and put, giving that story over about what that area has to offer is, is very important. Uh, otherwise, you're just part of a massive marketing campaign for your for your country, or you know, um, and people will be kind of drawn to the bigger uh, locations or the the more prominent ma- uh, locations that have a, a marketing uh, power. So, you know, we're not trying to attract thousands and thousands of people because we don't have the infrastructure to take that on. But tourism is part of uh, the economy. Uh, down on the peninsula and it's just finding that balance i think um possibly something that's really flared up through covid is you know the visitor numbers that we encountered last summer for that period of time when we opened was really really high for a period of time uh, possibly higher than the capacity um but you know we couldn't really do anything about that just to due to circumstances but you know if if we are going to have a sustainable tourism industry that can maintain well-paid jobs, then the season has to be longer than three or four months. You know. And to date, have you noticed that the season has extended, or are there those kind of spillover benefits of the of the tourism initiatives that you've already carried I think, out? Uh, I, I'm not talking on anybody's behalf, but I know yeah. you know Laura and the gang are, are here today as well. The the fact that these tourism attractions are open for the whole year and they're part of the local community as a a local cafe or whatever make you know that attracts people all year round mm-hmm. if if the attraction is closed then people won't come to stay or visit so one thing is dependent on the other mm-hmm. um, so embedding these uh, community centers stroke attractions uh, within that marketing campaign is really important because then people realize, well, I want to go for four or five days away. Well, they've got things to do if it's raining on four or five different days. And Mm -hmm. because we've encouraged the eco-museum sites to work together, there's a culture there now of sending people on to the next place or asking what they're interested in. So you're keeping the the money in the local community. Um, I know Angus is on the call and I think that's something we pick picked up on in Sky, where possibly people were being attracted to Sky just to visit the really big um, distilleries, the main attractions, burst in, get all their money out of them in the shop, and then take them back to a hotel somewhere. Well, that, you know that's no benefit to uh, the local community. So, you know, we we really need to see how we can sustainably exploit tourism and bring benefits to people. And so, Laura, could, could you touch on that? Maybe how it has affected the the sites, the National Trust sites that are part of their fund grant. Well, definitely, in terms of kind of extending the season, I think we're seeing a lot busier. We can we can, especially in places like Abadaron and things now. You, they're not kind of as quiet as they used to be. So it's kind of it's definitely kind of being spread. It's the sun isn't getting any quieter, <laughs> but at least the shoulder season are uh, kind of, there's more steady kind of visits throughout the shoulder seasons and the winter side. You've got more of that kind of different market, I'd say, that are coming for the walks and for the coastal paths and for that culture and the wildlife and things like that. Those are the kind of visitors that we see more in those off-peak seasons rather than the kind of hordes that are descending on the beaches perhaps in, in the summer so it is kind of it there's, there's a there's a an extended season but also like a 
different market as well that kind of takes up those front extended bits of the season. Not to be negative about summer visitors, but yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, that's a really positive and, and really clear impact, I suppose. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask at this stage before I take over? Is there anything else in the chat that's come through individually? Yeah. Or? I think there's a question. How did you choose the seven partners? Mm, okay, I also can't see that one. Um, so the seven partners were working together anyway through the Coastal um, Festival. Mm. Um, we did set, they are the seven main heritage sites on the on the peninsula anyway. Um, the, we did draw criteria when we were establishing the Eco Museum that they had to be open all year, have toilets, um, car park, um, a cafe on site or very close by, and internet access, I think, was the other one. Um, so we chose them because they'd worked together and they know each other really well. They had the same target audience. But saying that, we don't exclude any other kind of heritage establishments either. Um, say now maybe a smaller one that's maybe not open all year round but have an event on. We still promote what they're doing through the mo this model. So everybody's kind of gaining from it, really. And uh, I think that feeds into the, the business community as well, doesn't it, Gwynnen, where, you know, the businesses can take advantage of the eco museum model to, to, to market themselves for out-of-season visitors. Yeah. So one thing feeds off the other then. So, you know, you, you can't, we don't use the platforms for two weeks for the price of one or £50 off your stay in our accommodation. But if they are promoting activities or, sites or they have good pictures on their social media feed then that can be shared so you mm. encourage that culture of sharing what the area has to offer and then it's up to the consumer then to decide well actually i might stay in that location whoever the name is on top of that facebook page so mm. you know it's a, it's a much more subtle way of marketing instead of giving the power to whoever's throwing more the most money at, at it really yeah um, I see Angus, you've your hand raised. I, I just to make that point as well that um, I mean, this is the model you guys have used, but it's it's very different in lots of other places. Um, Angus, you can unmute yourself there and thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got some uh, specific questions. Um, I'm working at the moment on uh, our sort of I suppose tourism recovery marketing strategy um, after sort of coronavirus. Um, I was quite interested in how, how your um, local blogs specifically, that's an idea that has come up in discussion that we're, we're, we're pushing for at the moment, which is uh, getting some local families going out and blogging about their experiences of visiting locations um, uh, during the kind of downtime of our tourism here. Um, I was also kind of interested to see if that's how you're, you're thinking about your blogs, are you marketing them based on your expected audiences? Your target audiences were quite similar to ours, the heritage enthusiasts and the and the families um, and that sort of thing, because we feel that they would be the the, the likely audience to, to, to stay for a week or two uh, for longer and increase the visitor spend and the quality of visitor that they really connect with it. So I just wanted to hear how that was going um, for that. Part. Yeah, so I think Blogs for us is kind of a new, I know blogs have been going around for years, but this is the first time we've kind of been using blogs on the website. I think, um, yeah, we want to make them as approachable as possible with regards to content. So yeah, as you um, family friendly stuff, um, at the moment they're quite nature specific, quite heavy on, on the nature side and what you'll see if, you're, if you if you if you come here, what do you see whilst you're walking the coastal path and so forth. But, we definitely want to get more kind of user-generated contents um, on the blogs, um, and hopefully we'll have a series of them going out very soon. Another thing to, to keep an eye out for Angus and, and everyone else, um, Linda is on the call here. She's been working on, um, in Ireland, providing some kind of additional information for the existing looped walks. And I know um, Ben is doing something similar in Wales. 
um, with that kind of very general audience in mind, but but a general audience who want to find out more about what they can see and, and to learn, you know, what's around them as they as they are out and about. Um, so keep an eye out for those those things as well. Um, and I know you guys, you said you're updating your channels at the moment, so we'll we'll be watching you too <laughs> to see what you're doing. Um, is there anything else there then? I Again, I have nothing else coming in in my Just, chat. Uh, uh, Sorry. One, oh, Lucy Hunt, yeah. Yeah, one thing for me, just um, to support local knowledge, you know, like there's only a couple of us on this call right now and it would be great if the wider community and it's it seems to be the same people who are interested in the program, but you know, just for the local community, how can they know about this project? You know, there's, it just seems that I know COVID's restrictive and everything, but it seems that it needs to be out at, at a wider level. And I know we're trying to support you and trying to spread the word and sharing it on social media and everything. But I just feel that there's still, you know, you're a bit into the project now, but there's so many people that don't know about it. So it'd be great if you had a strategy of, you know, outreach, um, to get it to the wider community because I think people are only finding out about it the day before or you know things like that as well so just if there's some sort of strategy you know we can try and support you in it but I just feel further outreach to the the local community in Ivra is needed and maybe um Wales ye have some reference to that as well um, I'll, I'll, I'll just come in quickly there you know I think we're in a very privileged position to have the the seven years under our belts um, and the partnership work before that. So we are quite well established uh, with the work that we're doing, and obviously the partners in Wales do collaborate and work together. Um, you know, Gwen and shared some of the initial uh, data with the social media channels and so on, but um, it's just keeping that connection with people really and. People have to buy, you know, it's just very difficult at the moment to, uh, you know, we're trying to arrange some events for the early early summer, but I think the only things that we can develop at the moment are self-guided walks. Um, you know, everything is just so restricted with COVID, but, you know, what, what, what we are encouraging is that the business community talk to each other and talk to the Eco Museum sites just to see what those options will be possibly from the middle of April forward with, with the opening and so on. Um, and I, my, my message to, I don't you know, it'd be quite interesting to hear what Angus, uh, what, how things are going up in Sky, but it's really important that the, com the business community say what they want out of this project as well, instead of, you know, uh, I, I, I know there will be a marketing officer working over in Ireland quite soon, but as 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 a business community, you need to really be pushing for certain things that you think w will allow this to su succeed. And mm. looking beyond the project, because you know we we managed to find funding for from different places to carry this project on for a period of time, and this three year period is a bit of a luxury, to be honest. Um, you know, it, it's just very unfortunate that COVID has mm. come in when we've started the project, but. I'm I'm very very uh, I'm adamant that once things do free up, we will reap the benefits of this very quickly, and the you know the business community over here are aware of the project and and they are ready to go. Um, going back to Gwen's presentation, she the the training element of the project has been offered to um, accommodation providers, to other people as well. So. You know, we, we start with the business community and then we look, well, how do we share this learning to white to the wider uh, public uh, who live in, on the peninsula so everybody moves along at the same speed, really? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it is challenging, um, but it's hard work. And I, 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 I understand possibly the frustration of the live team in Ireland that they're, they're, they're finding it very hard to get that message across and to get people on board. But, Hopefully, over the next six months, things will be better and we will be able to visit you and 
we are looking forward to a, a, a gang of business people from Ireland coming over to see what we're doing. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it 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 is hard at the moment, and I think one of the difficulties as well is that when we're all sitting at home, where the things that we are doing are perhaps a little bit less visible than if we were out and about, you know, having kind of public engagement or whatever. Um, but there is an awful lot going on, and and it's at a range of different levels of kind of trying to speak to different groups as well as individuals. And as Gwen Ann mentioned. It's a large place, so <laughs> trying to speak to people from each different village as well. Um, but we are very nearly out of time. Angus, you have your hand up again. No, just um, uh, our will mentioned there in terms of um, how, how the Eco Museum in Sky is is going to be viewed during uh, like uh, during I suppose coronavirus and how that's impacted. We would. Um, we would have had a, a 12 months of community events um, like uh, outdoors um, and we haven't uh, we've um we have returned to do um we've a lot more kind of local history specific projects engaging people locally um developing skills packs and things like that so we've engaged in a sort of different way than we expected to um in terms of our um, overall kind of um like promotion of of um of our project again we've been uh, yeah, we've been a little bit sitting on it for 12 months. We were supposed to have a big launch um, round about um, early spring last year. Um, but we still have a lot of that kind of material like ready to go at the time that's suitable. At the moment, I'm putting many community events in the diary because I, I think that um, a lot of these uh, uh, gatherings are going to be uh, a little bit, but people are going to be quite cautious about it initially um, over the next few months. And that's something that we all have to be very much aware of. I've heard uh, from the... Uh, um, uh, uh, our funders, uh, which are lottery, the lottery uh, largely, um, in, in sort of in, in England and, 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 and things like that, and uh, more urban areas, they're planning big, large scale launch events in Boris Johnson's made up date in June um, <laughs> to uh, say that everything's open for business again. Um, and uh, there's a lot more caution in Scotland about about that sort, sort of attitude. Um, but uh, one of the ideas that we are, we've kind of worked on as well is that um, we've we're trying to find ways that we can partner up um, some of our businesses that are really good at marketing um, on social media with those that are less so, so that they're bringing each other up um, in, a, in, in, a, in a really positive way, and that has uh, that's had a, quite a, quite a positive uh, kind of recent take up. Um, and again, we've got a marketing plan that we're just about to sort of get going, so hopefully you'll be seeing a bit more as, as you were saying Lucy so hopefully that answers the problem was yeah thanks for that Angus it's 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 always good to know how other people are doing as well um that brings us up to five o'clock uh which flew by so thank you everyone for joining um I think you all know by now how to get in touch with us if you'd like to and please do um the link to this will be sent out as I said to everyone who signed up um, so you, you'll get a recording as well. And we look forward to chatting to you again soon with more events. So thank you very much, especially to those that presented and answered questions. <laughs>